Yeah, thanks a lot for this introduction and hello everyone. And thanks a lot again for inviting me for this talk. It's my pleasure today to be with you. So yeah, I'm Omar and today I will present our research which is titled as COVID-19 versus social media apps. Does privacy really matter? So let's start. And yeah, like um, this research is done by me and done by Professor Jean Grondi and Professor Mohamed Abdel Razik and Dr. Sharif Hagag. So let's start with the outline. So here is the outline of what we will speak today. We have five sections. So we will start with the introduction and motivation, and then we will have some research questions, and then we will have the methodology of our work and the findings. And then I'm gonna discuss the, since I found that your group is actually very interested like in um, kind of emerging things and emergencies and pandemics and things like that. So I will add um, that these things, you know, are usually kind of um, uh, like the apps which handle um, pandemics or like emergencies are usually having major accessibility issues. So yeah, I will also include this in my talk today. So, um, so, Let's um, start with the introduction. And um, there are some interesting facts that I would like to highlight for points of them today. So COVID-19 apps play a very important role in like reducing um, and stopping like the global pandemic if 60% of the public have downloaded and started using these apps even lower percentages of using these apps will help in fighting the, like the virus and decreasing its propagation. So actually um, what happened since like we are now over um, like the pandemic and actually when I did this research, it was in the middle of it. So due to major problems regarding privacy and regarding accessibility issues, we haven't reached these percentages at all. So yeah, and this is why I'm, I will discuss with you today, like um, why we haven't reached these high percentages of downloads and usage and adoption. So yeah, and governments are actually promoting for the residents to download and um, using COVID-19 apps. So, uh, and the, at the same time, some of these governments are actually restricting the usage of social media apps. So like you can see there is, um, uh, big difference when it comes uh, to the government behavior. So let's say an app like TikTok, some governments are actually uh, kind of banning it or trying to put restrictions, but um, like user, uh, but they are uh, encouraging people to use like COVID apps. And actually, this is very interesting because he users, um, like, as, as I say in my last point, like people are influenced by media and they think their privacy is extremely viol um, violated when they use COVID-19 apps. And yeah, like um, things are not in its normal position because like the apps which really attacks your privacy, you know, are actually um, um, not having so many concerns by the users, but, and the governments are trying to um, limit the usage of these apps, like social media apps. And on, on the other hand, for COVID apps, they are actually kind of not, like most of them are not, well, like it's evidence that they are not 
violating privacy. They even like, let's say, uh, the COVID safe app, it actually doesn't see your real, your real location, just, you know, the mobile devices contact each other without knowing, you know, where are you? Like they don't have any, um, any idea about your location or anything. So anyway, we will go further um, into this during our presentation. So this strange behavior led to a huge interest in using um, social media apps, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. But at the same time, this huge interest is not the same at all uh, with COVID-19 apps, despite their huge importance in the current pandemic. So there is, as you can see, like there is a very interesting thing. So like the social media apps usage is proven to become much more, uh, uh, to have much more usage after the pandemic, but there is, which um, uh, doesn't help, you know, in ending, let's say the pandemic or anything and uh, apps which the governments promote and is proven that it could work to end the pandemic are, act are actually having low adoption and download rates despite, you know, like their huge importance in the pandemic. So from a software engineering perspective, despite the huge importance of COVID-19 apps and also their high funds, there are some development challenges. Since COVID-19 apps are saving lives and they should be accessible by everyone in the community or in the society, regardless of their age or gender or culture or current like or, or original country, like we can see in user reviews that there are significant problems um, other than privacy as well, like not just regarding privacy. So let's jump to our two main research questions we are addressing in our research. So the first question is about how is personal data handled by COVID-19 and social media apps like mobile apps? And the second research question is about the key issues raised by the users of COVID-19 and social media and productivity as apps as evidence in user reviews. And yeah, like um, before, like I talk about the methodology, I just yeah wanted to highlight that I used user reviews because usually they are the most trustful feedback. So let's say, you know, if you do a survey, people might be influenced, you know, or might be biased or, you know, depending on the organization, which um, um, like kind of um, do this survey or, you know, maybe it can differ from one region to another. But with user reviews, if you are not happy about the app, you know, no one can tell you don't submit, you know, a bad rating or, you know, if you are happy with the app, you will go ahead and submit a rating and you can actually see reviews from the whole world. So not just like um, from a specific place, you know, like usually with surveys, they are um, not showing the whole uh, population. So with user reviews, it's actually, um, yeah, like much more powerful in terms of feedback, in terms of actually like honest feedback so let's talk about our methodology and it's consisted mainly in two of two parts so first we did a manual analysis of privacy policies terms and conditions and that i use agreements in covid 19 apps and highly used social media apps and second we did an automated analysis of nearly 2 million user reviews of covid 19 social media and productivity apps and we classified them into five main aspects. Also, we did that on both Google Play and App Store. So we have diversity like um, to ensure that the problems we are discussing is actually 
discussed by like by by everyone like in the society so yeah because even the operating system like um, um like the privacy issues for example people think you know that in in uh, in uh, in iOS, you know, like Apple operating system, um, the device is more secure, you know, and things like that. So we wanted to know the opinion about um, uh, like, like everyone in the society, either they are using like Android devices or if they are using iOS. So how our automated user reviews analysis tool works so first it extracts user reviews from both app store and google play and then it detects the language of the user reviews and then translate non-english user reviews to english and then it classify user reviews into several main aspects depending on the words and we do like like i i don't want to go like into details but we do like some of the tokenization and stemming and like I mean to ensure because some people even you know like they write like or after translation since we translate you know the translation is not very like kind maybe of correct you know so I mean we do some analysis before we we kind of do the classification and then like we automatically generate various types of uh, statistics so let's jump uh, to the findings. Um, so we can see that COVID-19 apps are actually more transparent since the majority of them are open source. And actually you can go and like, I mean, if you check my paper, like you will find that I, I have uh, like, a data table you know for every single app and yeah you will you like you will find that the majority of them are actually open source so there is nothing to hide you know you know the algorithm of everything like yeah so it's 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 it, it should be like very kind of trusted and um for like for volunteering, you know, like some, the bad thing about uh, COVID-19 apps, let's say in Qatar or some other countries, you were kind of forced to use it. And it's actually kind of uh, strange or maybe funny, you know, because these apps were like, let's say in Qatar, you had to use it and you had to use a uh, kind of uh, a golf area ID like so all, all the visitors doesn't like I mean in order to use the app you need to verify your identity with um, um, with with the app like with a uh, with a golf area like um, uh, ID and actually so all the visitors if I am there I wouldn't be able to use the app but I'm forced to use it or I will have a fine so I mean like accessibility here was very, very bad. So how you can kind of force someone for a good purpose, you know, to use an app and at the same time, not allowing them to, 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 to access it. So, yeah. And also um, for the privacy part, like COVID, uh, yeah, actually, like yeah, for for the social media apps, you know, no one force you, let's say, to use Facebook. No one use force you to use TikTok. No one use force you, you know, to use let's say YouTube. Nothing. You choose by yourself, you know, to choose it to to use it. And for the privacy, like in COVID nineteen apps, the identity of users are masked and the data are usually deleted when no longer needed, where in social media and productivity apps we included in our study, the data used, the data of users are used outside of the app scope. And actually like all of us, you know, we need to admit that we actually doesn't look to, um, uh, we don't look to, um, 
like the privacy policies so we just accept it however if you read it and they actually like kind of make, make it in a way not intentionally but because they don't want to get sued or something so they include every like i mean let's say if you want to read the facebook privacy policy you know you will get shocked and you will say ah i will never let's say use this app again but you know we use it because i mean it became part of our life and um because no one actually reads these policies and it takes so much time you know like yeah like like average time i i did it on like for for the m health apps and the average time was around 20 to, to 30 minutes to read each privacy policies so i don't think anyone will just um read you know the privacy or read actually the privacy so for the privacy policies part it shows that covid19 apps are way more transparent since the majority of them are open source while all social media apps included in our study are not moreover COVID-19 apps better support privacy and better limit usage since the identity of users are masked and their data is deleted when no longer needed. While in social media apps, user data is used out of the app scope and the apps, as I mentioned, you know, use more data than it actually needed. And you can find more details like in the paper uh, like i will give you a quick example like some apps you can see that it access let's say your contact list so and the app has nothing to do with your contacts or you know like access your camera and it has nothing to do with your camera so you know this is like a very strange behavior so for the user reviews part it showed that covid19 apps are less stable and have higher installation uninstallation rates and user requests and social media apps and higher accessibility issues but at the same time they have less advertisements so they're all like covid19 apps almost had zero ads so um you know there is no tracking for users or so on so here you can see the distribution of different aspects across star ratings in each figure. For example, the privacy one, uh, like you can see that when users talk about privacy you know, on, on Facebook, it's usually, they usually give one star rating, while in COVID apps, like only um, like uh, around uh like between 20 to 30 percent gave one rating app so usually actually and it's very you will find it like very interesting in our paper when people raise privacy issues in uh, in their um uh, comments like or in their user reviews they talk positively and they say let's say that i ah, you know we it's the app is very safe to use it's it it um like handle our privacy in a good way so not because they mentioned privacy issues it means that they are talking about it in a bad way so the major um findings of sorry do, I, do anyone have any question uh yeah what does the symptom as the x-axis stand for so it's uh, an app which is uh, like um it's an app which is done um, like yeah, you will find more details in the paper, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's an app which give you like general information about COVID, you know, and it, it was done uh, by a third party, not by a government thing. So, so yeah, it doesn't um, track people at all. So it just give you more info information about the virus and yeah, things like that. And uh, yeah, so the major findings of um, this study is that uh, privacy and personal data are more violated and exposed in social media apps compared to most COVID-19 apps in which many, peop many people have lots of privacy misconceptions about COVID-19 apps. And that's why they have low download and adoption rates. And more COVID-19 app reviews talk about privacy issues, but in a positive way, 
and COVID-19 apps usually have many severe bugs and instability and accessibility issues, most likely because they have been developed and designed and tested in a short time span. And more research actually needs to be done on how to design and implement any like emerging apps or future public service that needs to be rolled out quickly in a way that allow users to be sure that their privacy is not violated. And so, yeah, I actually will talk now about um, like the accessibility problems uh, and the, like I'm highlighting some actually interesting facts that um, this problem we had with COVID apps will most likely reoccur in every upcoming emergency. And, you know, like, as we saw like governments and we talked are talking about uh, are encouraging people to download and use social um, um, uh, to don Did don you drive up show honk and roll your window and throw it out on the front line? Sorry? I, I didn't hear your Hello? question. Yeah. Did you hear what I asked? No, sorry. Can you, can you? Say again. I, I didn't hear what you asked, sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't know I needed So yeah, let's keep uh, the questions still um, in like the end. So, um, uh, so yeah, so, as an extension, we did another study, you know, to, to understand why people were unable to use or download um, like COVID-19 apps from an accessibility perspective. And we used a wider definition. So emerging apps are those like COVID-19 apps, any app which is developed in an emergency. And accessibility issues are those issues that may affect or prevent users from downloading uh, or logging, not just, you know, like uh, people who have a physical problem or, yeah, so we had wider definitions. And we also, um, uh, as we, we, I mentioned before, like we used emerging apps because they can decrease economic loss and save lives during emergencies. Well, and also they are developed, these apps are kind of developed um, in a short time span compared to other types of app and they need to be rolled out quickly. And as I mentioned, they are more um, prone to accessibility issues. So yeah, as I mentioned, the situation in the pandemic was very strange and that's why we wanted to investigate in another study, you know, what are the most access common accessibility issues in uh, emerging apps as evidenced in user reviews and app version history. And because you know all of you that when developers release an, um, an, uh, an apps, they usually include like some version history or about what this update is doing and how we can provide uh, guidance to app developers to design and build more accessible emerging apps. So the methodology was done that in the, in the main three phases, in the first phase, we work on user reviews. And in the second phase, we did a manual analysis of a sample of classified user reviews and manual analysis of apps version history and description and then in the third phase we developed an advisory tool for software developers of emerging apps and the main key contributions of that like we did an automated and manual analysis of almost 220,000 user reviews and we wanted to identify the accessibility issues and we also did a detailed analysis of the version history of common COVID-19 apps. In the next slide, we will see an example. 
So we can see like here in the COVID Save app, people were like the app was not allowing anyone having an Australian number or foreign numbers to use the app. And you know, the government was recommending everyone to download and use it. And you can see in the app version history, the developers added support later on to international numbers and the same with um, with like pro to go like um, pro to go like safe in Poland it was just in Polish and people were complaining how an important app like that is just in in not in English you know and then the developers made an update and it became in English and Ukrainian so and we also developed a new tool like called the EA AER, where you know it asks the developers some questions and based on their answers it gives them recommendation of what needs to be did, done so they release the app from the first time with, um, without accessibility kind of or to, to reduce um, the accessibility issues and yeah we did an evaluation with real world developers and we found that it's promised, like the tools promise in supporting more accessible um, app development. And in this next slide, we will see an example. So here it asks, you know, the developers, will the app be available to download from local or the international store? And if they say only national store, this means that anyone having an app, an app store or a different country will not be able to access the app or to download it. So it's recommended to, um, to make it a, as an international um, store or like what an Android firmware versions the app support, you know, if some apps only supported uh, the latest uh, versions. So um, yeah, which I mean, makes people having older devices not able to use, um, the app at all. So, and we found the major findings that many people cannot download or access COVID-19 apps due to like they were unable and actually like when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about um, kind of any app would be developed. I'm just giving an example with COVID-19 apps, but it, this problem will most probably happen in any other apps that is developed and deployed to users in very short time span so most like um, many people and may, were not able to register due to like let's say the app only support national numbers or require national id or only supports the local country language or doesn't support you know all age groups even some covid apps like to, in order to download it, you need to be 17 plus or 21 plus. So I mean, people um, like teenagers, for example, cannot download even the app. So I mean, it's a major accessibility problem. And we found out that several COVID-19 apps are not tested to be accessible by the like old people or disabled users. And we found out that there are no tools or guidelines uh, are found to be um, able to reduce or prevent accessibility issues while developing emerging apps. And I would like to acknowledge that um, this work uh, is par partially supported by the Australian Research Council Laureate Fellowship and Discovery Project and by Monash Fit. Thanks all uh, for attending today, and please let me know if you have any questions. Um, thanks, Omar. I think there is a question on the chat. Uh, this, I'll read it for you. I think some social media, such as Facebook and WeChat, also provide some supporting functions for COVID. Could you slightly explain how this affect your findings? Yeah, actually, um, because we like kind of worked on another um, like study, you know, because 
um, social media, um, like let's say Facebook, you know, it uh, it kind of delete, you know, misinformation about COVID and things like that. So it's, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's um, like um, if someone is actually uh, say, ah, you know, I will not use COVID apps because it violate my privacy, then he cannot get this support or like, I mean, if he reads a privacy policy of both, he will find that like, um, let's say Facebook or WeChat or whatever, you know, violates the privacy much more. So we cannot um, uh, kind of uh, depend on on, on Facebook or or any other social media platforms to 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 solve this problem, but it's it this is the bad part about it. But in the other part, they are more much more accessible and like almost everyone have a social media platform, either it's Facebook, Instagram, or so on. So uh, raising our awareness through these platforms is actually uh, uh, very good. So yeah, like, I mean, it depends really um, on, this, on, on, on which, um, on how you look to it, like social media apps can be very beneficial uh, in a way like raising awareness, but also, you know, there are many, uh, um, many misconceptions and things also like, yeah, like it's double edged thing. But the main point is for me, like, or the main finding for this study is actually people think that COVID-19 apps are actually having or like violating the privacy, but actually it doesn't do that. And like, I mean, most of them and the only problem we found is that they are not accessible compared to um, to compared to so social media apps or yeah so so yeah like this has a major problem and the other side also has a major problem so yeah it's uh, that's why it's um, challenging yeah like to find a solution where uh, a social media platform that users can trust which uh, which uh, really doesn't violate the privacy and at the same time to um, yeah like to to be accessible by people thanks um there are two hands up uh, me did, did you want to talk about your question all right, so thank you very much for uh, an interesting talk. I just have a, maybe one or two questions here. Uh, okay. So my first question is, did you have a chance to look at um, uh, people's attitude towards uh, privacy matter? For instance, I would, I would imagine that at the very beginning of the pandemic, where when you know, only a few countries um, was actually having problems, uh, the attitude toward sort of Privacy matter would be very different from uh, from the attitude toward the same matter, but now. So yeah. that's my first question. Uh, the next question is that um, you mentioned about COVID nineteen apps, but what exactly are the functionalities of those apps that you consider in your research? Uh, I would say that there are certain different personality. For example, toward the beginning of the pandemic, we might see um, contact tracing apps. Uh, but now I, I would imagine that only in a few countries that becomes, uh, let's say, uh, an important part. But now it's more about, for, for instance, um, vaccine, um, the sort of um, COVID vaccination, for example, that would like, uh, become more and more um, of the uh, dominant, um, let's say, personalities yeah. of of those of those apps so I, I i just want to see how those um um let's say issues uh was handled in your research or maybe matters let's say handled in your research yeah 
Yeah. So, so basically, uh, for the second question, we only, uh, I will answer it first. So we only included the apps which are actually developed by the governments or supported by the government. So only, we only included the official apps. We didn't look into any other third parties app. So our, um, study focus was on the main, like we, we included all the official apps, uh, which had a like a usable like and high rate usage uh, of COVID-19 apps the only app which we included uh, um, like the COVID symptom was uh, was um, done by a third party and actually it showed that it, it was very interesting because it even had much higher ratings than the governmental one and it showed that people are still willing you know to use third party apps uh, when like uh, compared like they promoted their app that it's just kind of educational app um, so it doesn't really uh, uh, like um, access your location or track you or anything it just give you more more information about the virus you know about symptoms and how you uh, should act if you have if you get COVID uh, like yeah so so yeah, this was uh, very interesting, you know, and also um, uh, um, um, uh, so so sorry. What, what was your first question? Like I just yeah. So uh, I I think my first question somehow is also related to the second. Um, so I, my question, my first question was, um, do you see the change in people's willingness um, in using those app? Um, as time passes from the beginning of the pandemic yeah. uh, up to now, because I think that the matter of personal privacy will yeah. become very different uh, in that sort of uh, time frame. Exactly. So actually, um, this is a very good question because, as, as I mentioned, we were um, we were uh, like um, analyzing the. Um, release notes uh, of uh, each like let's say for covid safe app when they release an update they say um they they, they um, release a, uh, a note about what they do and we found actually that many apps have improved even the privacy um, um part and we found also in the reviews like let's say in the first days of covid uh, safe app people were attacking like just listening from media you know no we will not use the app and things like that and when the government here released um like a kind of clear privacy pol policy we found that this kind of one and two star ratings started uh, to change to four and five when people really understood the concept and so that your actually location is not, uh, you know, like kind of uh, accessed by any way, it's just, you know, like uh, the mobile, like let's say I have COVID and I'm coming next to you. It tells your phone that, ah, you know, you got in contact with someone having COVID, but where does this happen? It doesn't say so. I mean, or, or the government can have no access to that. It just give you an alert, you know, that, you got in contact with someone um, having COVID. So when people started to understand the benefit of having COVID, uh, like or like having contact tracing apps, they started uh, kind of using it. And then you know, like um, uh, we believe that, um, um, like when. Um, uh, when when the adoption rates uh, in some countries uh, were very low, you know, I mean, um, people became less uh, kind of um, willing to use this app because what's the point of using uh, uh, an app that contact other devices if I see no one else is using it? So it makes kind of um, no sense. So so you know like. So some people kind of even in COVID safe apps say, ah, oh, you know, now we deleted the app. It's no longer like kind of uh, 
be uh, useful for us, you know. And same, you know, like let's say with the QR codes. You, so many people were just using it, you know, during uh, when it was a requirement. And once, you know, um, like it became not a requirement, people kind of stopped using it. And even, you know, like supermarkets and things like that uh, don't put a QR code anymore. So, so yeah, like um, people, the, the needs for people change over time and the usage as well. That's why uh, these apps are kind of very seasonal, you know, and they come suddenly and they are way, way uh, more prone to accessibility program problems compared to social media apps, you know, where if I have like, let's say a Facebook account today, if you come to me next year, you will find that I still, most probably I will still be having it, you know, and yeah, even if I have concern, I will continue using it, but this is not the same with the emerging apps. I would imagine that um, social media apps is mainly for ent entertainment, and this is not a very, very different uh, matter as I would, I, would, I would think so. Anyway, thank you very much for your yeah, answer. Thank you. Um, we'll give uh, for the next question, uh, Derek, if, if you'd like to. I, I think my internet connection is not clear, so I'll just send the question over. I'll give yes. it thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it says, come to think of it, there were two camps of users in the context of contact tracing, the users of the app for individuals and business owners who are required to display the QR codes in their premise. I wouldn't imagine that they would be reviewed by business owners in the user's review, but by any chance. Would this perspective be in test in your paper, if not in your opinion? Would there be any putative access issues for COVID apps as a business owner? Exactly. This is a very, very good question because let's say, you know, in some countries, um, like um, let's say in Qatar, because I gave already an example uh, before about this, like workers were even complaining that let's say you know your employee force you you know kind of uh, like because it's a governmental um, order so all businesses and everyone um, like you you should use the app but like there were so many reviews saying ah oh, we couldn't actually access the app and we should kind of be using it so you know like it was a big problem for um, kind of business owners, you know, it was even problem for workers, you know, like um, that they cannot, let's say, <clears throat> if I'm an electrician, like let's say working in Qatar and I don't have a national ID there and the app require a national ID, this means that if I have a business, you know, I cannot do anything anymore because I, I I should have the app and uh, I mean up and running and I cannot access it and actually this problem stayed there for a couple of months I mean before they solved it um, uh, yeah so so yeah you know it's um, like uh, and and from the other side actually some people had misconceptions that uh, let's say when I check in, uh, um, let's say at Woolworths, for example, Woolworths administration will have my information and things like that. So no, you know, I will not check in or I will. Um, uh, and this is actually like if you read the privacy policies, it's not true. Like it's just all about that. It, uh, it, it, it takes, you know, your mobile ID like and like every user has a specific ID, not your personal data. And let's say if I checked in and let's say to Woolworths today and I discovered later on that I had COVID. So I would report to the Department of Health that I have this ID, you know, and I went to like to like I had COVID during this period. So they sent to all the mobile IDs which uh, checked in at this Woolworths 
at the same time that uh, someone, you know, had COVID, but poor worse doesn't know who, who is this person, you know, so I mean, there is no information kind of saved except, you know, uh, and anonymous ideas. Um, so I hope this uh, answered like uh, your question. Uh, all right, uh, Jeff, your question. You've been in Brisbane, took a while for government. Omar, oh, are you hearing me? Yeah. All right. On your on your last part, have you have you happened to look at the work of Mark Jackson at Stanford? Um, okay. And the reason I'm asking is because if you don't have um, um, you if you have IDs, right, you at least have one trace point, so you might be able to trace that ID um, uh, by, by time and location, right? And you could work out where that went. But the other thing, if you just have um, IDs and locations, right? And then you have um, time pushing that out, right? You can kind of look at the flow of, of COVID over, over space and time. Right, so you can yeah. see where there was a um, somebody reported COVID at a particular location. You can look at the other IDs that were at that location, and then see where maybe those IDs went after that. Were you were you doing work in that direction to um, watch the flow of COVID based on um, the information the apps gave? How did that work? Yeah, and actually, like uh, I can see that um, Lim in the chat is um, like Derek is saying, like, yeah, it actually some some uh, businesses were kind of let's say even doing a paperwork, like they say, ah, oh, you know, you leave your like doing it in a manual way that I uh, leave your name and contact number in order in, in case like and they collect this information. This why it happened because you know like the government were kind of like the, in Queensland where they were not ready to to issue an app which can handle uh, this emergency in a quick time. Maybe because they wanted to make to make sure that the app um, should be accessible um, by like every should be accessible by, by everyone in the society and so on. So. So yeah, like, I mean, some businesses, um, like, yeah, definitely we're kind of accessing um, user information if if they use a third party app or if you, they use a manual procedure. So, so indeed, you know, like there were, there were some kind of uh, violations that happening before uh, the governments there produced like the COVID app. Yeah. And and and, and sorry, like um, so so Jif, did you like uh, did you have a like question or something like? Um. Yeah, I just wanted to know. Um, basically, in your research, did you find out how the um, the data was assimilated to see? how COVID spread um, given the information that came in from the apps. So if the app delivered an ID and a location in a time, was it able to um, follow through with watching that particular ID and through various changes in time and location, and then come up with um, essentially network clusters of how COVID developed over time and place. Was, was this kind of um, data used for that type of analysis or was that type of analysis done more on an individual researcher basis? Because um, lots of news agencies reported um, that certain events were um, spreader events, right? Where you had people gathered and then um, lots of people came down with COVID um, after that event and so forth, right? So some of this, you wouldn't need an app to figure out, right? You would just need 
somebody watching the crowd at a given location and reporting out. But if somebody's doing this kind of contact tracing, right, on an individual research basis, right, that, that would mean essentially interviewing people who had COVID and asking them where they were at certain times and tracing it out. Now with the apps though, right, you could have a lot of different data. And if you were able to get it and, and see various um, points of change and then look at the way uh, maybe COVID was identified in different locations at different times, you could yeah. put together pretty interesting uh, yeah, def yeah, definitely. You know, the app was uh, very powerful in that. And if you understand the concept, because some, like as I mentioned in my paper, actually some uh, some apps, but very little, like uh, consider, like used your actual location. But right. most most apps use just you know like an uh, like an um, an ominous kind of ID. So let's say, you know, uh, let's say I'm going to Bunnings. Uh, Bunnings have this ID, you know, and I have an ID. And then I report later on if I have COVID that, yeah, you know, like I am having COVID. And then my ID check, you know, where I went. So, so, so like Bunnings will not know who I am. You know, the government, even the government will not know how, how who, who I am and the most interesting thing as well is that at any time you can go and kind of delete your data or you know when the government is not using it anymore they just delete your data while as uh, Derek like let's say mentioned in um, like uh, manual process um, like you don't know if you used a third party app or like if you used a manual method, like will this data will be deleted or not? But in contact tracing apps, in, in most of the apps, in including in, in my study, you know, you can just delete your data or the government will just delete it when no longer used. Or actually, like in Australia here. I think the data were deleted every 30 days. Like, so I mean, they don't really care about um, about uh, historical data, like, because yeah, I mean, COVID, like if you had COVID, it just, yeah, like it takes two weeks or whatsoever. So they don't care about previous uh, history where in, uh, in, uh, in Facebook, for example, like, it tracks every single thing you do almost. It tracks, you know, your even interaction with other apps. And, you know, even now iOS has a feature where it asks, send a request to, to Facebook, you know, that you are not like asks the app not to track. So, so you know, and they kind of never delete your the data, except if you go, let's say, and delete your profile, you know, like, yeah, I mean, it's just, way way complicated you know to 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 handle your personal data using social media apps all right thanks everyone for the participation and questions uh, i think we are almost time um so uh on behalf of of everyone of of AI for Pan and everyone presenting to um, participating today, I'd like to thank Omar for yeah. his um, uh, talk, and then best wishes um, for your future. Yeah, thank uh, you so thanks much. a lot uh, again um, for this invitation, and I hope uh, my session and my talk was really kind of helpful, especially like to your group. I think like um, yeah, it does. It. Uh, it, hopefully, you know, I covered uh, the concepts of people and like, I mean, the behavior of people when it comes, you know, to to apps done by governments in an emergency situ situation and social, like, yeah, I, I, I hope I covered everything in this topic today. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.